Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to the Board of Registered Nursing Committee meetings. It, this is October 7th, 2021, and we will do roll call to establish a quorum. My name is Dolores Trujillo. I am the current president of the Board of Nursing. I have been appointed by Governor Newsom to serve in the direct care provider role. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, I am appointed in the Nursing Services Administration role by the governor. Thank you, Mary. Elizabeth Woods. And I've been appointed by Governor Brown. Okay, um, thank you, Betty. Imelda Seha Buckwitz. Hey, good morning, everyone. Imelda Seha Buckwitz, public member appointed by the governor, Jerry Brown. Thank you, Imelda. Susan Naranjo. Susan Naranjo, public member appointed by the speaker. Thank you, Susan. Jovita Dominguez. Good morning. Um, this is Jovita Dominguez, appointed by Governor Newsom and in the education role. Thank you, Jovita. Loretta Melby. I am Loretta Melby, or Lori, and I'm the board's executive officer appointed by the board. And Reza. Good morning. This is Reza Pejuhash, board legal counsel. All right. We've established a quorum um, for today's meeting. Can we take, beer and moderator, can we go to open comment for the public? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, real quick, Dolores, this is Reza. Are we going into... Um, okay, it was, sorry. Uh, this uh, is okay. the nursing practice. So yeah. I, I'd like to ask if possible, uh, to reorder the agenda on item, I think it's 7.4. Uh, we have uh, somebody who's standing by in case there's questions yes. or, or would like to discuss. Okay. And uh, he, I think, had a hard stop at 10. So, okay. Um, we if can that's go a possibility. And start with that. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank and we will come back to public comment for items not on the agenda. Okay. Uh, so, 7.4, do, do you want me to kind of introduce this or? I thought Betty, this is Betty's, Betty's nursing practice. Betty, would you, would you like to introduce this one or would you like me to? Well, I'd like to, for you to introduce the 7.4, but, uh, I thought we were going to do before then the roll call for this particular committee and then for, ask for public comments in that, or we can just go to 7.4. Yeah. Maybe we can just take roll call for this committee and then uh, jump into 7.4? Yes, that'd be fine. Okay. I also need to give instructions, please. <laughs> yes, go right ahead. Good. Okay, let me do that first. Good morning, this is the BRN moderator. I will be moderating the meeting. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When the board or committee reaches a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, the question and answer feature will be turned on and members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by inserting the phrase, I would like to make a comment in the question box, which is typically in the lower right of your screen. I will then call on the individual and unmute their microphone. The individual will have two minutes to make their comments. I will not give a warning as your time approaches. I will mute your microphone and announce that your time has exceeded the time allotted. I will then move on to the next member of the public who has a comment. Please note that the question and answer feature is being used only as the means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the board. Such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. When asking a question, please make sure the question is directed at the host, me in the dropdown. If any attendees utilize a profane name, they will not be called upon to prevent members of the public from being subject to profane language. While you are free to express criticism or negative views for the sake of the members of the public participating on the call, please do not use profane language when making public comments to the board or committee. 
I will provide a brief reminder of this approach at the start of each public comment item. Finally, when board members or senior staff are not speaking, I would like to remind them to mute their microphone. If I detect background noise during this meeting, as a result of unmuted microphones, I will interject with a brief friendly reminder. Thank you. This is Elizabeth Woods again, and uh, I will open the nursing practice uh, committee by taking a roll call. Woods is present. Dolores. Dolores Trujillo is present. Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan present. Bovita Dominguez. Bovita present. So we have a, a, a quorum for the meeting. And uh, my understanding is we're going to go right to 7.4. And as I will be leading that discussion. Thank you, Betty. Um, yes, yeah, 7.4 is an item that was added to the agenda uh, upon request from uh, a stakeholder. Hopefully you all had a chance to review the letter that was in the meeting materials for this committee. That's a copy of the letter from the law firm, uh, Atkinson, Anderson, Moya, Rude, and Romo, um, requesting an opinion from the Board of Registered Nursing. So. Uh, that, that letter provided a, a lot of background information, an analysis of some of the law, um, and, uh, and their particular request of the Board of Registered Nursing. Um, you should also know that while they've made this request of BRN, they've simultaneously requested the same thing of the Board of Vocational uh, Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians, BVNPT. So that board is kind of concurrently um, going through this, this with the BRN and I've been in contact with uh, that, the BVNPT's council and, and we're kind of um, progressing um, through this at the same time. So the request uh, just, uh, we also have uh, an attorney from that law firm, uh, Michael Davis as a participant uh, in, in our, in our um, list of participants here. Michael is available if you want to ask him any questions or if you'd like him to speak on this agenda item, uh, we can have him promoted to a panelist so he can, he can speak and you can address him and he can address you. Um, but briefly, I'll just kind of hit the highlights of, of again, what this is about. Um, so in the public school system, the uh, federal law requires that students with special needs receive a, uh, I think it's referred to in their language as a fair and appropriate, uh, it, there's terminology that they have to receive an equivalent education and receive reasonable accommodations to allow that to happen. Um, there are some students who um, have certain conditions. In this particular case, it was a seizure condition, a serious condition that was, uh, from what I understand, not treatable with other remedies and cannabis derived products seem to be uh, fairly effective in treating it. So this student has a physician's recommendation to use a couple of cannabis derived products as a treatment. One is, I think, a um, um, Kind of a preventative and one of is more of a um, kind of a rescue from uh, from the onset of a seizure um, and the uh, Mike Davis and his law firm represent uh, a number of school districts and so the question that the school districts have brought forward is would it be within the RN's scope of practice to assist a student who has a physician's recommendation for the use of cannabis products, um, would it be within the scope of practice to assist with the administration of that on a school campus, uh, pursuant to these individualized education plans that are, are created as part of kind of the special education uh, process within the schools where uh, school administrators, the student and the students uh, representatives as well as their, their, their medical um, personnel put together these individualized plans to uh, address the student's needs. 
So, so that's the question that has been brought forward. Um, in, in order to respond to that question, um, a couple of possibilities have been discussed. And from what I understand, this is not the first time that the Board of Registered Nursing has been asked about administration of, of cannabis products. So in the past, I believe the NECs have issued responses informally uh, upon request finding that the administration of cannabis is within the RN's scope of practice. Um, in this case, a, an informal opinion did go out from the board's nursing education consultants, um, which I believe was also included in your meeting materials. And uh, the further request is to, for the board to, for, for this committee initially to consider the issue and uh, if it so chooses to make a recommendation to the board and uh, have this considered at the board level for a more formal opinion. Um, I can talk a little bit about the, the options and the process for doing that legally, um, just real briefly. So typically uh, our, our, our discipline cases, you're all familiar with the Administrative Procedures Act which governs the, the formal process for our discipline cases. Within the Administrative Procedures Act or the APA, there's uh, an additional section about what are called declaratory decisions. Um, the, a, a definition of a declaratory decision is a written opinion containing a statement of undisputed or assumed facts and a determination of issues relating to the application of a state agency rule, regulation, order, statute, or administrative decision as it applies to a situation in which the agency has primary jurisdiction. Um, so in other words, it's a type of adjudication to resolve some legal uncertainty within the board's jurisdiction uh, about some type of actual or, or possible legal question or, or case or controversy. Uh, and it's, it's essentially a decision to determine the rights and the legal obligations of the parties, but without, uh, under a specific set of facts, without actually ordering any action or any, you know, uh, remedy or any type of enforcement action. So it essentially allows somebody to bring forth a legal question like this, and it allows the board to uh, through a formal process to render a decision. Um, so th there is a specific, you know, um, formal process to do that, a, a set of statutes and regulations that governs that process. And uh, I don't want to go too, too much into detail about the process, but um, it is, again, it's governed by the Administrative Procedures Act and it's, um, it, the the proceeding doesn't necessarily have to follow the same formalities of a formal, say, discipline hearing. Um, <clears throat> um, there are certain requirements once we receive a request, we have to respond within a certain number of days to the requester. We also have to issue a notice to any, anybody that we think might potentially be interested in the outcome of this action and uh, they, they have an opportunity to respond to the board as to whether this is appropriate for a declaratory decision and, and, and also possibly comment on the uh, substance of the question. Um, so that is to say, th this type of declaratory decision is limited to, the, the effect of it is limited to the parties involved. So whoever brings the question forward to us in this case, it would probably be considered the school districts that uh, this law firm represents. It would, it would only apply to them. Um, but interested parties have the opportunity to um, seek an opportunity to comment and, and the board can, um, can, can reach out and, and invite public participants who may have a stake in this to, to comment. Um, now, another thing I just wanted to mention briefly is the opportunity, uh, as I said, this, this type of decision would apply only to the parties involved. Uh, this issue, though, it, it's been um, mentioned that this 
is not necessarily kind of an isolated incident. It's something that may likely reoccur in the school districts again and again, uh, particularly as these types of medications are, are kind of more widely embraced and um, utilized for, for these types of conditions. And uh, so given that it's a potentially reoccurring issue, the board has the opportunity if it chooses to take a decision that it renders and declare it to be what's called a precedential decision. Uh, meaning no longer does it, does it, uh, is it limited to affect only the parties involved in that decision, but it can be relied on in other cases as precedent. So uh, in the future, say that the board um, issued a finding, a determination that this was within the scope of practice and, and not a violation of our practice act, uh, that could, if it were a precedential decision, give some, some measure of confidence to the school districts and the RNs who are kind of out there uh, dealing with this issue. And if it were ever to come up, both sides could utilize the decision as, as precedent. Um, that's not to say that it can't ever be overturned in the future, either by change of law or by uh, the board taking a different precedential opinion, uh, but, but that's that's an option. Um, so, so again, the question um, was, was kind of described in the letter. It's, it's, it's being put to this committee to discuss, to um, uh, possibly put forward to the full board for further consideration, uh, possibly of taking some of those actions that I just described. So um, with that, I will turn it over to any questions from the committee and if the committee would like, we can get uh, Michael Davis on it if you want to, um, as I said, address him or, or have him address the committee. Real quick, Reza, this is Lori. I wanted to let you guys know that Elaine Yamaguchi, the EL for BVNPT, and their legal counsel, Kenneth Swenson, are in the participants as well. And um, I've asked them, as well as Michael Davis, to be elevated to um, participant or panelist, sorry, so that they can um, answer any questions for you guys. This is Betty Reza. I do have a, I do have a lot of questions about this. So I'll try to make it brief because I don't quite understand it. Since this has been going back to till uh, 2018, when the child involved in this uh, got permission to go to a regular school and for the nurses to to give the cannabis. So I. I'm uh, perplexed as to why we are dealing with it three years later. And uh, did somebody bring this up because they felt nurses shouldn't be giving cannabis? Um, I can, I, I want to let you finish it and then I can. I, can I think that's right. I, mean, I have a lot of things in my mind, but I don't want to be just rolling out questions because maybe there'd be a, a simple answer to some of this stuff. We can, we can take them one at a time. Um, so first of all, I wanted to clarify, you referred to 2018. Uh, there was a document attached to the letter from the law firm. It was a decision from uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings. That decision was, was provided as background information. It was an attachment to uh, the letter from the law firm Therefore, you know, in, in um, including the entire letter and everything that was attached to it, that was included in your meeting materials. The, the question now is not relating to the 2018 student. Um, again, that, that OAH decision um, describes kind of a different situation, but it does provide a very good, uh, in my opinion, explanation of a lot of the uh, legal issues surrounding you know, the, the passing of medicinal cannabis and current, uh, the current status of it between state and federal law and, and a lot of that. Um, as well as it talks about some of the federal law relating to uh, special education requirements, which you know, I, I for one wasn't really too familiar with the um, 
FAPE uh, requirement. Um, Is this under the Compassionate Use Act? Well, it, it kind of combines a number of different um, things. The FAPE, and I'm trying to find what that acronym is. Um, it's a free and appropriate public education. I'm sorry, I knew that it was on the tip of my tongue. So FAPE refers to a free and appropriate public education. Uh, and, and Mike could perhaps explain this better than I could, but um, that under federal law, there's a requirement that uh, that all students receive a free and appropriate public education. Um, in the OAH decision that's included in your meeting materials, uh, the administrative law judge considered that under that separate federal legislation that, that is not part of the Compassionate Use Act, under that uh, law relating to educational requirements, in this case, the it was permitted to allow the student to receive the cannabis products at school in order for her to receive a, a free and, and uh, appropriate public education so it kind of blended it, the, the court considered the compassionate use act and the fact that california has this has, at this point for quite a while had this legislation that basically recognizes the medicinal benefits of cannabis and um, considering that uh, within the framework of this federal um, legislation requiring the, the free and appropriate public education that the judge ruled that um, the student was entitled to be able to receive that medication on campus. Um, but again, that, that was a different situation. The current situation that, that, that the law firm uh, has immediately before them uh, relates to a another student who similarly suffers, I guess, from severe seizures. Uh, and I think they are trying to have this student partake in, in classes that, if I'm not mistaken, are, are ongoing right now. I'm not sure what the status of that student is, but um, the idea, I think, was, and, and part of the urgency of, of getting this on this committee's agenda and then the board's agenda in November was due to the fact that this student um, may kind of be in limbo until um, un until there's there's some some something some some decision uh, some outcome uh, again I don't know what the status of that is but they're 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 dealing with a student now who has um, who there's a question as to their ability to use that medication on campus as, as recommended by the physician. Uh, and again, that's, that's the one case that I'm aware of. And then, uh, as I said, this is, is probably something that's going to come up time and time again uh, in the future. Does that help? Somewhat. Perhaps we should hear from the people who are here to discuss this whole thing. Uh, We'll get a better picture of it because I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure what we are supposed to be considering in this <laughs> for, for this whole thing. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, so I just wanted so so Marianne McCarthy has issued a letter um, from the board saying that you know based on the statutes and that it. A licensed nurse can administer cannabis with a physician order um, without risk to licensure. That's already been issued, right? So now what's being requested is that the board issue a formal opinion as well as this statement. Is that what's being requested? And what would be the risk to us as a board at all? I mean, why would we not want to do that? So the the inform the, the opinion from the nurse education consultant. Um, that, that's a type of response that they, uh, from time to time, issue in response to various types of inquiries and, and like scope of practice questions and things. And they're, they're a bit informal. Uh, I, I don't consider them binding legally in any way. Um, so it, it is, 
I think usually helpful to the recipient, but it's not something that they could necessarily, for example, you know, um, cite in, in legal papers or anything like that, if it ever were to come, come down to uh, issue like that. But uh, so I think that's the main distinction is that they are uh, kind of informal and, and not a formal opinion of the board itself. And they are uh, essentially non-binding in the future, but it's, it, it's, it's helpful. So you're correct. What's being asked though is, is for a more formal opinion from the board itself. And is there any risk to us it, the risk. federal government um, because of the so, federal laws? If we were as a board, is there any risk? I mean, what would be the downside, if any? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't see a great deal of risk to us. The, the, the reason I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time talking through the procedural provisions about declaratory decisions and precedential decisions and all that. It was to, to make you aware that there, there is a formal process for doing this. It's, um, it is there in statute. It's explicitly in statute that that's not considered uh, rulemaking that needs to you know, take place under the other rulemaking process. Um, as far as you may be concerned about, you know, violation of, of like the interplay of, of federal with federal law, given that technically cannabis is on uh, federal, um, what do they call it, controlled substances lists. Um, I, I think the letter from the firm does a pretty good job, as well as the decision from OAH of kind of explaining the current state of affairs with all of that. Um, I, you know, as you know, can, California is not alone in medicinal cannabis, if I'm don't quote me, but I think the majority of states have it. Uh, I, there was a reference, I don't know if it was in the letter or um, even in the, the Rincon Valley decision, but uh, it may have been, or if not, I'll just mention it. It's a federal um, rider amendment that's that's been in place for, I think, seven or eight years now. It's been passed every year, uh, the Rohrabacher Amendment, which I looked into, and it it essentially precludes the federal government from interfering with individual states administration of their medicinal cannabis programs. Really, I think that the question that's brought to you is kind of a narrow one. It's I mean, there's a lot of questions about still, you know, medicinal cannabis and you, know, you, you can ask about the efficacy of it and, and a whole lot of questions about it. I think really kind of the narrow question for the BRN is kind of limited to this. Is this within the RN's scope of practice? And is it a violation of the Nursing Practice Act? Um, so all the other questions about it, I think are up to school districts, up to the physicians that are you know, issuing the recommendations and, and all that. Um, that's how I see it, but that, that's, that's the question to us. I don't think there's, uh, a tremendous amount of risk in us just making a, a, an evaluation of whether this is within the RN scope of practice. Um, and the, the NEC's response, as I said, that, that's a non-binding answer. I mean, technically the board could issue a formal decision that, that uh, decides it the other way. Um, but, um, yeah, that 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 decision, uh, as you saw, it does conclude that it's within the scope of practice given our um, statute. I think it's 27, 27, Perhaps we should hear from the people who came to speak about this issue. Are there any other questions from committee members or do we want to uh, just so I understand Davis. So at the end of the day, what we want to do probably is make a motion um, of for an opinion that would go to the board in November um, for vote. That's that's what we're looking at potentially doing in this committee. Right. So so the if you were so inclined, the motion might be to um, support moving this forward to the board 
you could so so for one thing I'd, I'd like you all to kind of consider you know do, do you have any feeling about this substantively if you disagree with the NEC's recommendation we can talk about it if you um, you know we, we can talk about the issue substantively if you don't disagree with the NEC's conclusion then uh, you might make a motion to submit this to the full board you could choose to just leave it at that for their consideration, or you could make a recommendation that the board um, go down the path of uh, a declaratory decision and go down the path possibly of a precedential decision. Um, you could include one or, or both of those pieces as a recommendation in your motion if you choose. Um, what else? So th does that help as far as? I mean, I just, I don't, the outcome? I, I agree with Mary Ann's letter 100%. I don't have any problem with that. Does, do any, does anyone else on the committee have? No, this? not at all. Yeah, so I just think maybe, I don't even know if we need to hear too much from the other people. Maybe we just make a motion to move this forward. Betty, do you have concerns? Or Ovita? Um, I thank you, oh, Mary Ann. I mean, Mary. Um, I feel that um, I, I'm I'm for it. We give Marinol to cancer patients and to patients failure to thrive. This is just another um, you know situation that that marijuana is is needed for this child. That she must have a neurologist that has you know checked to see what other meds she can get, and this is probably the best one for this child. So I would like to ask the question. So for the IEP um, for the school, the plan of care for this child, um, is this oil um, and the nasal spray, is this bought just from a dispensary or a physician's order is attached to it? Um, I, so the physician, from what I understand, and, and Mike is, is in a much better position to kind of address the specifics, but um, my understanding is the physician has kind of specifically recommended those products. Yes. As to where they acquire it, I, I can't say yeah. for sure. I would have I just, assumed well, it was I'm a just dispensary. wondering if there was a physician order involved in this. I so. believe that's the case in every, every one of these situations. Okay. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, use of recreational cannabis or anything on, on no, school. No, no, I is, get it. This is... Um, yeah, only medicinal as as recommended by a physician. This this particular child is under Kaiser, and in in the information that we were provided, they they've had many type of uh, consultants with Kaiser with uh, neurology and that, and it's Kaiser that provides it provides it. Yeah. Eddie, so do you want to hear what? Well, I'm still somewhat um, confused as to what the board, why we're involved in this, and um, and this is this instance was the, on this particular one child, but now are we? Is the board being asked to make some type of a recommendation that? This should be allowed for any patient that a physician says that should have it. So, Betty, so, this is Lori. I might be able to provide a little bit of clarification. This is a common question that comes into our NECs on um, a routine basis. They get asked several times by various um, RNs whether or not their license is at risk if they administer medication um, medication containing THC or CBD to their patients. Um, there are also caregivers that come in and they'll email and ask those same questions. So through BPC 2725, um, a RN can administer any medication through any route as long as they're competent. Um, additionally, we had a, were in contact with Elaine, who is on this call to the EO for BVNBT, and um, checked in LVNs that are employed um, can administer um, THC or CBD derivative medications under a doctor's order as as well. So um, 
because of these constant questions and because we're hearing that some school nurses are worried about their license being disciplined, um, that they cannot administer this medication to the students that are either written and have an IEP or simply just have a medication order to be followed. Um, it's, it's imperative that we make, I believe, a general statement um, that addresses that so that the, the people that are administering these medications underneath their scope of practice feel protected and um, reduce that hesitancy so that the proper care can be delivered. I don't know that it needs to be specific to a patient. I think that it really does need to be um, more general and that this, this is because we, the NECs, do give a generalized statement. That statement that Dr. Marianne McCarthy, the supervising NEC, released is an identical statement that we released to these questions as they come in. Um, and we don't have anything on our website that they can refer to. They do have to go ahead and send an email to an NEC if they're concerned about a scope of practice issue. Um, it would really kind of clear up some of that in uncertainty. Um, we know as nurses and practicing nurses, um, we administer this stuff all the time. We administer various types of medication through various routes, um, again, based on our competency. So I, I think it would be a good move to have a statement by our board, either in support um, or not in support or with some caveats in there um, that we can have people reference um, in a more legal way. So you want something to be put on the website from the board uh, as to um, the interpretation of this? It's, it's so, much bigger than that, and I can have Reza explain that, but we can put something on our board website that would additionally help. But um, this is bigger than just putting a statement out on our board website. Yeah, uh, so I, I, like Lori said, I think that's that's a good way to say it. This is bigger than putting a statement on the website, there's, I think if, first of all, if a, a request is brought to the board for a declaratory decision, you have to deal with it in, in some way, either granting it and, and going down the route of considering it and issuing the decision or rejecting it and not doing that. Um, I, I presume the rules probably state that if you don't respond to it, it's, it's within a certain time probably presumed denied but um, in any event they're, they're making the request here and you, you kind of um, in, in one way or another we, we need to respond to it um, also I think it, it is somewhat an, a, an interpretation of our scope of practice so um, you know I always have a little bit of concern about just putting on a statement on our website that, that is uh, interpretive uh, that, that raises some, some red flags sometimes about, you know, are we kind of entering territory that's rulemaking uh, that ought to go through the formal rulemaking process. The process that I described uh, of doing these declaratory decisions, and if, if you choose making it a precedential decision, that's an explicit exception to the rulemaking process. So that's all, um, you know, you don't have to go through establishing a regulation to say that this is within the scope of practice. It would just be a formal decision that interprets our existing statute about the scope of practice and, and applies that to this set of facts. And if it's declared precedential, then anyone in the future could kind of rely on that decision to a much greater degree than they could on some informal opinion. So issuing something more formal, as, as Lori said, would give the RNs out there and the school districts who are kind of confronted with this question a, a much greater measure of confidence that the board doesn't consider, you know, assuming that that's where the board ends up, that the board doesn't consider this to be a, a violation of our laws that are under our jurisdiction. I'd like to try to go ahead and make a motion if I can. Do, are you guys ready to feel like we need more discussion on this? Um, um, Betty, did you want to hear what the speakers that have been elevated to the panel have to say, or you want to go to a motion without that? 
I think since we asked somebody to come and discuss it, that we should do that, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we want to turn it over first to, to Mike Davis. And then, as Lori said, we've also got uh, from BVNPT, their executive officer and legal counsel. But Michael Davis is from the law firm that, that brought this request. So maybe uh, see that Mike is unmuted there. Good morning, Reza, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all very much for taking the time to consider this question. Uh, as um, has been mentioned on this this meeting so far today, this is a question that's come up a number of times. Uh, you know, in fact, over the last couple of years, uh, you know, when presenting at at conferences about this, this is the question that comes up: Is this uh, is administering med medicinal cannabis within our scope of practice, and can I get discipline for it? So I think the way that Reza framed the question uh, in that two-part inquiry really, really hits the the nail on the head in terms of what the issue is. Uh, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, I guess provide any information that I'm able to uh, to to this board here. Uh, and so I'm I guess I'm open for for any questions or discussion. Uh, Mike, this is Reza. Um, Obviously, one of the concerns has been kind of what, what is the need for this? And you, you heard me speak a little bit about that, that I, I presume it's kind of to answer the questions that you just said and, and give that kind of measure of confidence to those practitioners out there who are, are confirmed with it. Is that, can you kind of confirm, is that really the, the, the reason for the, for the ask? Uh, yes, there's that, the general, the general question. And then, of course, the question that we have specifically in a case that we're dealing with now. Uh, as you mentioned, Reza, there are, you know, this is kind of an intersectional point for lots of different areas of law. Um, and so as as the judge's decision or the OA, the ALJ's decision in the Rincon Valley case laid out, uh, as well as I think we put this in our, our letter, you know, we're feeling confident that we're addressing the kind of bigger legal questions. Uh, the question that we've not been able to, you know, definitively answer is the question that the BRN and the BVNPT need to make. Um, and so in our case, you know, the concern was raised by, by, by a nurse and uh, we weren't going to, you know, ignore her concern. We want to make sure that our medical staff is, you know, uh, acting within the scope of their licensure and, you know, not being put in jeopardy by uh, you know, implementing a care plan for a student uh, whose physician has, has said this, Here's the student's condition and, and here's how we treat it. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're addressing our medical staff's concerns and and go right to the source in this case, uh, the BRN and the BBNBT to have some definitive guidance that we can pass on to them and, and they can see themselves uh, and also send you know, some guidance to the associations throughout the state that are you know, working hard to represent nurses and, and LBN's interests. Uh, so I think this is something that benefits, uh, you know, students, our medical staff, and kind of the broader community. So this is more or less a clarification of something that RNs have been doing within the scope of practice for several years now. And yes, that, that would be correct. So we need to have it a bit more clarified by the BRN. I'm just trying to understand what was Yes, going. yes, yes. No, no it's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, in the, the case that, or the 2018 case that you were re referring to before is a different student in a different school district. That's a, you know, it's separate issue, or I shouldn't say separate issue, but separate set of facts, but very similar situation and very similar overlap with all of those laws. Um, we just have not, we've not reached the point yet where you can go and you know, do some research and definitively say, um, you know, there's no jeopardy to your license. You know, we can read the, the Nursing Practices Act and, and see what the causes for discipline are. Uh, but when you get into a nuanced question like this, there's a, a greater need for, for clarity, okay. you know, specifically from the, the licensing boards. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any uh, questions? Okay. Is there somebody else there that is going to speak to this issue also? 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. Elaine Yamaguchi from BVNPT. And uh, very, very briefly, um, we wanted to say first thank you to, to BRN, to Ms. Melby, and, and, and your learned counsel. We've been discussing this alongside um, over the, the past few weeks. And it's a it, it seems that obviously not a new thing and certainly not going to go away. In fact, it's going to become a bigger and bigger challenge, I think. For both of our boards, so and I appreciated um, Reza's and and Mr. Davis's uh, summation that really the the question put before your board and ours is that more narrow one of is this treatment within scope? And our NECs have been working as well on a um, on a statement really looking at that scope and making that finding. So um, we're not quite done yet. Um, our education practice committee will be meeting on and this will be on the agenda if on the 27th and they'll be asked to make a recommendation to the full board fairly similarly. Um, well, we have not and, and would not, you know, um, prescribe right now. It'll be up to the committee how to move forward, whether this is a declaratory, a presidential decision. Um, setting a longer term policy, we certainly want um, our licensees to feel comfortable in following a physician's orders and something that they're trained to do. And we want them to to take care of their patients. So, and, and like everyone, if there are any questions specific to our board, I'd be happy to, to answer. This also raises the issue of uh, nurse practitioner prescribing also. Yeah, that's a good thought. So if we have um, I'm trying to look at this in two so, ways. In one way it seems like it's a small issue, but then the more you talk about it, it became it becomes a large a larger issue and then we have to have uh, and I don't know if we need to do it with the with the LVN board. I'm just not sure of all these uh, particular laws that we have to deal with with all this now. Um, this is Reza. A um, couple things. One, as far as like the BVNBT also considering this issue, I mean, technically we're independent boards. We're not bound by what they decide and, and vice versa. Uh, but given that it's, it's, a, you know, identical question being posed to both, um, the, the process being uh, done kind of in parallel made sense. Um, as far as like nurse practitioners, for example, and prescribing and all that, uh, I haven't really kind of, you know, tackled analyzing that. And, and frankly, I think, um, as I said, I'm, I'm in my mind, the question is pretty limited and it doesn't, doesn't really even necessarily get into that. The, the question is very specific and it, in any declaratory decision, it would be very specific and Anything that's not really at issue in the declaratory decision would not be, you know, decided there. So, nurse practitioner prescribing of cannabis um, is not something I think we necessarily need to get into. The question really is: is the administration of cannabis by any RN um, pursuant to a physician's order um, a um, allowable within the scope of practice. But it's not just physicians that are making these orders. Nurse practitioners make these orders also. I, yeah, I'm not sure what the, the laws on the cannabis side say about who has to make the order, whether it's open to NPs or whether that, on the, I think that would come from the, the, the laws governing uh, recommendation of cannabis and whether it can be anyone besides a physician. I don't know if Mike has any additional information on that, but. The, Reza, you're, you're correct. Uh, the compassionate use act refers to physicians typically, and I can give you the citations to, um, to point to that. Uh, but in here, I mean, I guess you could, and this is more your wheelhouse. So I'm not going to get too far into it, but if you have a, a nurse practicing under a physician, 
know, maybe that would be a, a situation that would work, but you'd still likely need the physician to be the one who makes the recommendation. Um, and, and there's also an examination requirement. So before making the recommendation, the attending physician who can be, um, you know, individual who possesses a license in good standing to practice medicine, podiatry, or osteopathy by the Medical Board of California, the California Board of um, Podiatric Medicine, and osteopathy. <laughs> of course, I'm on the meeting here with all of the medical folks, and I'm messing up the names. Osteopathic Medical Board of California. So these folks need to have responsibility for an aspect of the medical care and conduct a medical examination before uh, making that recommendation. I think that whole thing needs to be clarified because we're going to be seeing nurse practitioners in much more independent practices right now. So I don't think it's a, something that we should just uh, not consider. That's probably a separate uh, issue though from what we're asked to talk about today, right? Well, they're all separate issues in and of themselves, but they all relate to one another. Um, real quick, this is Reza. So a couple things. First of all, um, just want to mention, I, I believe we, we only have uh, Michael Davis for a few more minutes before he's got to get off the line. Um, also, as far as, you know, these issues, I, I agree. In my opinion, it's, it may be possible to kind of sidestep that, but I, I have to think more about that. In any event, I think whatever the ambiguous issues are that are out there that are kind of within our jurisdiction, <clears throat> excuse me, and that relate to this, probably are better off being answered rather than left ambiguous. So if, if that nurse practitioner question kind of is appropriate to fold into this, then you know, we can do that. If there are other questions to, to fold into this, we can, we can do that. But um, it's, again, it, it's pretty, I mean, it's limited to what's, what the question is that, that's brought to us and anything that, that's kind of directly related to that. But um, yeah, so any any other questions for Mike? Yeah, I have one. Um, Mr. Davis. Mr. Hugh. Hi, good morning. So I have a question. Um, so is this separate than the FDA approved drug um, Epidiolex? Um, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, this is different. So, okay. So there hasn't been any questions of a LVN or RN dispensing this FDA approved drug. It's more of what comes out of maybe a dispensary. I'm just trying to, I don't want to lump them all into one group. I just, I'm looking to kind of separate so that we focus on the right, so that I can focus on the right issue. Right. So real quick, Dolores, this is Lori, just to make this perfectly clear here. The Epidiolex is a CBD, it's a cannabinoid. It does not contain the psychoactive. Um, the psychoactive, the THC part is um, contained in Marinol, Syndros, and Sesamet. And yeah. those, are, those three are also FDA approved. So there are four, um, marijuana derivative type FDA approved medications out there right now. And the Epidiolex is the cannabinoid CBD type that does not contain the THC. Just to, to be clear, the other three contain the THC. Thank you, Lori. I don't have any further questions. The only other question I have is the difference, if you could help clarify between if we were going to propose we recommend this go to the full board, whether we would want to recommend it be a declaratory decision or a precedential decision. Can you just clarify what the implications of those two options would be? Uh, I, I can answer that. <clears throat> um, real, real quick before I do that, I guess last, last minute, I can answer that one, but uh, anything else from Mike, I think we've we got to let him go for a 10 a.m. engagement. Hearing none. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Reza, and thank you, everybody, for, for your time and attention to this. Thank you for your time.
So, Mary, the, the difference, uh, a declaratory decision doesn't necessarily need to be made precedential, um, but really any decision under the Administrative Procedures Act, whether it's a discipline decision that, that you're so used to, or a declaratory decision like this. This would, by the way, be the first time, as far as I know, that the BRN has, has done a declaratory decision. Um, it's not real common, but um, and any type of decision can be made precedential. The, the difference is that a declaratory decision is kind of a different type of procedure where at the end of it, we're not saying, okay, this party needs to do this or that, or this party is going to be subject to, you know, probation and these terms. And we're not, you know, ordering anyone to do anything at the end of this. At the end of it, we're saying, here's the, the legal rights and obligations. Here's the interpretation of the statute. Um, that's, that's what a declaratory decision is, uh, as opposed to a regular type of adjudication where at the end of it, you're, you're ordering something. Somebody has to do something. Um, so that's, that's the distinction between declaratory decisions and other ordinary decisions. Precedential just means that the decision can be relied on as precedent by other parties in the future. Um, so to give you an example of that, in a different context, if for example, we had a discipline case where an ALJ made a legal determination that a specific act was unprofessional conduct, if the board wanted to avoid having to make that specific legal determination case by case, it could declare that decision precedential and then that administrative decision could be relied on in the future and cited as authority that says that act is unprofessional conduct. So it just, a precedential decision is one that can be relied on in the future. Whereas if it's not precedential, other parties can't say in the future, well, in this other case, you answered the question this way. So, so here, you know, that, that case should serve as precedent and you should resolve it the same way. Um, but does that, we clarify and not confuse things more yeah i just what why would we not want to make this if we do want to say that we this is not a violation of the you know nurse practice act um and you won't be your license won't be disciplined for this why would we not want to make it a precedential decision what's the risk of that versus a declaratory well a, a, a precedential decision is going to have obviously much wider effect it's not going to be limited to the parties that any, anyone can rely on that and so it's arguably a good thing if you're answering these questions for everyone out there that, that may have them. It's just, um, there are, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, okay. There, it's, there are different factors that go into whether you'd wanna declare something a precedential decision. One of them is kind of the the, the gravity of the issue, uh, and in this case, I think it's it's a pretty significant issue. And another is the likelihood of it to recur in the future. And as as you've heard, this is probably something that'll it already come is, up right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, in, in my opinion, it it seems beneficial to answer the question for a broader set. Um, but so so your motion, if you were to make one to to send this to the board, could include that this be um, considered in a declaratory proceeding and that the board render a precedential decision, or you could be silent on whether you want it to be precedential and the board could, you know, later still has the option to do that if it chooses. Well, I certainly think that this needs to go to the full board but I'm not sure in what, in which way we should do it as um, information. And you could even you be silent on, um, sorry to interrupt, but you could even be silent on recommending whether the board um, proceed with a declaratory decision. You could just simply recommend that this go to the full board for further consideration and I could address the full board with similar to how I did today with a discussion of kind of the options and the legal background behind that. And then the, the entire board could 
to make a decision. If you wanted this committee to, you know, take a firmer stance on it, then you could include those pieces as part of the motion, but it's not, um, not essential if, if you, if you are not sure you want to do that and you want to kind of leave it to the full board. Well, so several issues that came up today may need to be answered and brought to the board. And particularly, I have a particular interest in how this affects advanced practice nurses. And that wasn't clear to me today. And I'm not comfortable with just leaving it. Well, we can figure it out later. I think if we, it's a so, board. I just want to say, you it, should, know. it should include uh, LVN, um, uh, RNs and advanced practice RNs, and this doesn't seem to do that. Um, I can I make a motion? Are we ready? Because I think I'll just. How about if we just make a motion that we just advance this to the full board for discussion, and then we've got until November to clarify if there's issues about nurse practitioner, um, you know, whether their ability to prescribe this. Is that included in their prescriptive authority or not? That that can be something that can be looked at. We don't have enough information about that right now. Yeah. Um, so are you making a formal motion on the floor, Mary? I would. Did I put enough formal words in it, Reza, to make it actually be a motion? I, I second that. <laughs> um, let, let's, let's, hear, um, let, let's, let's hear it. Um, let's, let's hear it again, if you don't mind. So I think, I think or maybe I have to just put this forward to the full board for further consideration. Yes. Is that right? Yes, and we'd like to get more information that came up today. Okay, and who, who I seconded it? That, I mean, yeah, I could go with even a stronger motion, but I'm happy with just sending it to the full board if that's what most people are comfortable with. Let's take a vote, please. Woods, yes. Dolores Trujillo, yes. Sorry, Betty, uh, before we do that. We have to open for public comment. Uh, hold on, I, I want to. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Sort of in and out, Russell. You're in and out, yeah. Hello? Um, can, you, can you hear me now? If you can hear me, do go to public comment, please. Okay. Uh, Betty, do you want to have a speaker? Speaker? You're going in and out. Um, I was going to say something, but we just haven't heard it yet. I heard him can say, can you hear me now? Public comment first. Are you ready? I, I, can, I can open for public comment if you're ready. I guess Wes has finished what he had to say. Yes, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comment. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will meet your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type it. I would like to make a comment. Can anyone hear me? I heard you. I can hear you now, Rosa. Sorry, I don't know. Lydia Bourne would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Ms. Bourne. Ms. Bourne, are you there? Uh, 
I'm sorry, Miss Bourne, we'll come back to you. Miss Bourne, go ahead. Sherry Coburn would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Sherry. Thank you very much. Good morning. This is Dr. Sherry Coburn. I'm with the California School Nurses Organization, as well as a practicing school nurse. And just want to share that um, school nurses fall under also under the Education California Education Code 49426. Um, does uh, describe the uh, role and practice of a school nurse in addition to uh, BMP code 2725. Um, yes, medicinal marijuana has um, been being administered to students under the Compassionate Care Act by parents, but um, you have to re remember that um, it has come in forms of gummy bears and um, brownies and it, and in forms where it was um, immeasurable um, and oftentimes without prescriptive amounts um, because uh, prior to Epidiolex, there really was no medication to be prescribed and administered. So school nurses are caught in the quandary of how do we administer medication when there, there is no dosage, there is no specificity around um, that's uh, those specific um, forms of, of medication. And we do recognize that there is a role in helping children with seizures, don't get me wrong. Um, we also have to follow the California Education Code 49417, which states that um, school districts um, have the option of administering um, medical marijuana. And I would uh, really, uh, CSNO did submit a letter um, in uh, addressing that. And so I, I think the nurse uh, in her diligence is trying to make sure that this is an allowable activity under her scope of practice. I think it's 7414, real quick. We have that cited in our emails, uh, yeah. Four, 49417. So we would ask that the BRN consider that as well. Um, we do recognize that the Ca Compassion and Care Act does allow parents to come on campus, administer the medication if it is not in a prescriptive form. Um, the, the Ed Code 49423 does require specific information um, when a physician does prescribe and the parents do consent to the medication being um, administered to the child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. I'm going to try Lydia again. One second. Go ahead, Lydia. Lydia, I've unmuted your microphone. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry, Lydia. Board President Trujillo, or is that, I'm sorry, uh, Committee Chair Woods. Uh, we have no other further requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So we could go back to the vote here. Uh, Woods votes yes to move it to the board. Trujillo votes yes. Mary Fagan, yes. Ovita. Ovita Dominguez, yes. Okay. So we moved to the board uh, for in November for that meeting. And then uh, hopefully before that, we'll have some more information and some of the questions answered about the issues that arose today. It's helpful to get the information that was provided today. So thank you for that. Okay. Shall we go back? Can we go back now to uh, 
Do we have Jeanette Wackerly on the phone? Someplace? Jeanette? Jeanette is in the participants, so Mark will elevate her. Thank you. Jeanette, Jeanette, go ahead. And Betty, I think we need to go back to do the meeting minutes. I think we're actually even yeah. before 7.3. Yes, thank you, Laurie. I saw this also. Uh, the, uh, I move to approve the uh, minutes from June 24th, 2021. Do I have a second for that, please? I'll second. Betty, we actually need to go back to item 7.1. We have not done public comments for items not on the agenda. We went from roll crawl straight into that one. So we need to start with item 7.1. We'll do that then. 7.1, and that will be uh, any public comments for items not on the agenda. We'll need to open that up, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Woods, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, can we um, continue with the vote for these uh, to approve these minutes, please? Woods votes yes. Chihilia votes yes. Mary Fagan, yes. Jovita Dominguez, yes. Thank you. That uh, motion carries. All right, now we can go to 7.3. Betty, we need to do public comment on the meeting minutes. But we just did public comment. On we that. did public comment for items not on the agenda. Every agenda item needs a public comment. All right. Should I have taken the vote before that or after? <laughs> vote after public comment. All right. So we need to go, uh, go now for public comment, if there is any public comment on the minutes from June 2021, 24th. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment.
Committee Chair Woods, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you, please. All right. Now, we had taken the vote. Do I need to take it again? Lori, do you want me to take it again? We weren't able to catch the um, second. So if I can get the second, and if there's no changes in the vote, I believe we can move forward. Additionally, um, was resident elevated? I know he was down in a uh, attending. I'm position here. Department. Okay, can great, you hear thanks. me? Okay. Yes, we can. Great. Sorry, sorry about the technical difficulties, everybody. Thank you for bearing with me. And I, I would agree with Lori. It doesn't sound like anything's changed on the vote. This is Mary. I had seconded the Mary motion. second. Yeah, Mary second. So we keep. The Thank vote you, Mary. We can keep the vote as it is. Yes, we can, Betty, and we can go on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go on to 7.3, I believe now. It's a discussion and possible action on the nursing practice committee scope and charter, and we were provided a draft of that. And Jeanette, are you uh, on? It wasn't clear to me who's going to be speaking about this particular issue. Jeanette is on and um, she is the liaison for this committee so she can speak on this. If she has any questions or comments, I can jump in and help her as needed. Jeanette, are you there? I don't think she's on. Sure. Uh, Jeanette, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. This is Jeanette Wackerly, and I am going to go through the what we used to call the mission statement and is now called the charge for the practice committee. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to read the document in total, but I want to give you uh, the flavor of the mission of the California Board of Registered Nursing is to protect the health and safety and well-being of the public through the fair and consistent application of statutes and regulations governing nursing practice and education in California. The board's vision is to be a leader in the oversight of nursing practice and education by creating an administrative regulatory practice that safeguards uh, the public health and ensures nursing care is equitable and accessible to all. Finally, the board's values include effectiveness, integrity, transparency, collaboration, and equity. So the next statement has to do with the purpose or the charge of the practice committee. The nursing practice committee is appointed to advise the board on matters relating to nursing practice, including common nursing practice issues, such as the right of the registered nurse or the RN and the patient in communicable disease cases or the RN's authority in, to order perform laboratory tests and advanced practice issues in the practice of certified nurse midwives, certified nurse anesthetists, nurse practitioner, public health nurses, and clinical nurse specialists. The NPC also reviews staff responses to proposed regulations change that may be affecting nursing practice. So succinctly saying there are other uh, relationships to the board, the membership, the meetings, uh, what a quorum is, uh, who the board staff are, and how review of committee charter continues. Uh, that's my report and I uh, believe that you have it in front of you. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to go over those. Okay, any uh, committee members have any questions about this particular charter? I, no. just, I just have one, I think um, we said that the on the purpose and charge that um, the committee will advise the board on matters related to, um, to nursing practice, including common nursing practice issues. And then we have examples. I, I think it'd also be helpful to say it and emerging nursing practice issues. So some things, you know, when new things arrive, I think COVID has brought a lot of issues around. They really put the spotlight on nursing burnout, what have you. So to me, it would be important to have um, not just common, but also new things. I don't know how the others feel.
with you with your direction um, and maybe it takes a vote I would add uh, including common and emerging nursing issues to that sentence and then maybe um, in the such as put something about nursing burnout and fatigue okay Mary, where, where do you want to put that? Um, where they're in the parentheses, the such as. Okay. So, I see. Um, I added such as nursing burnout or fatigue in the parentheses area on this document, such as rights for the registered nurse, it would then be, include issues such as nursing burnout and or fatigue who wanted to add anything more to that let me know we just put except i didn't hear that Betty. Uh, i said could just add etc okay that sounds good okay so may i add just one thing uh, so we've made an, uh, an adjustment or a change to the purpose or charge. So I will incorporate that. And when, if you're going to send this forward to the next, to the board, I have your okay to make those changes. Yes. yes. Okay. Do we need to make a motion or anything for that? Or can we just, I don't know what the procedure is. Yes, when is. a motion is made to accept it, you can say, um, I make the motion to accept the charter with the stated changes. Um, and so that would be the motion. Okay. All right. I can make that motion to accept the charter with the stated changes. I will second that. But I think we need to open it up to public comment, my understanding. Yes, that's Some correct. Discussion? Okay, then let's please open it up to public comment, if any. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Woods, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to turn, uh, uh, close this window? Yes, please, thank you. Um, I'd yes. like to make a comment. Um, it's, it's Mary, you wanted the addition of nursing burnout. Um, how about moral distress? Do we wanna add anything in there? I, I think nurses exhibit both. This is Jeanette. For clarity, are you? Is this an addition to burnout and fatigue, moral yes. distress? Moral distress. But retain burnout and fatigue. Yes, of course. Okay, just just clarify. All right, thank you. Board President Dolores, if you want that change in there, there will have to be a new first and second just to change that motion around okay, to include make that. Motion. Um, after I make the motion and we vote, do we go again to public comment? I'm going to open that up to Reza, if he could chime in. Typically, a motion needs to fail 
and then go back through, but um, I would like to open up to him just to make sure that we can add the additional amendment if it's approved because it's all the same kind of wordsmithing. We can't hear you again, Reza. How about now? Hey, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to unmute two things now because I'm on the phone. Um, I, I would essentially look at it as a, a new motion and uh, so a new public comment just in case, um, you know, anyone else has feelings on the idea. Uh, if, if there's any other thoughts anyone else has on any additions or changes or anything like that, we can, if there's anything else, get them all out at one time and then um, and then handle them all in one motion. It's eventually going to go to the full board too for discussion, right? Yes. I have no other additions. Okay, then let's put it in public comment. So I think Dolores then made the motion to add that. Anyone second? I'll second. We do public comment. So we can uh, do public comment on this now, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. While we're waiting, just for clarification, this is this is in addition to the motion that I think just passed. So uh, this is, if this motion passes, both changes will be incorporated. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Woods, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. And then just for clarification, we will take a vote on both of the motions because there are two separate motions on the floor right now. And there, it's a additional language. There's nothing, nothing taken away. Did, I'm just adding. Did we vote on the first motion? We did. No, we did, we did not. We did. No, you're right. We oh, did. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought we'd voted and that carried and, and that we were doing a second. So, um, yeah, what Lori said. So we can vote on this particular issue, adding those particular words that we had spoken about. Jeanette, is that my understanding? We, we made some additions. Do you want me to, to repeat them? Just for clarity's sake, please, if you don't mind. Naturally, I moved my paperwork, so that's. I believe the addition were nursing burnout and. I add burnout, burnout, yes. Burnout, fatigue, and moral distress. Oh, the first one was burnout and fatigue. So, the, the, Excuse the, me. All I'll, of the changes I'll, include adding, quote, and emerging to uh, where it says, I think, common issues or current issues. Uh, adding nursing burnout and fatigue, adding et cetera at the end of that. Yes. I will read and that adding, to you. It, okay, we're like. adding moral distress. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. The wording is including common nursing practice issues, emerging 
nursing issues and parents such as nursing burnout and fatigue and added moral distress. Does that sound right? Um, I, I have to apologize. I, I thought we had, uh, as I said, I thought we had voted on the first piece of it before Dolores added the second. So um, I guess just for the sake of the record and who made the motions and, and what the vote pertained to was um, whoever made the first motion, uh, I think. It was Mary who made the first Mary. motion. Uh, it, Mary, are you fine with just including all of that in your original motion? Yes. Okay, and whoever seconded. Uh... Our second was Dolores for the um, second portion of it was Mary again. So how do you want to refer this to the minutes? You can put me down as seconding it. Thank you. Okay. You want to take it to a vote? Vote on it. Yes. Woods votes yes. Trujillo votes yes. Mary Fagan, yes. Dominguez, yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so we're moving on now to 7.5. <clears throat> And this is informational only from the nurse practitioner advisory committee. And um, I was not informed who's going to be doing this uh, information only section. I can provide the update. This is Lori. Okay. So for the, um, it's the nurse practitioner committee first. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. Thank you. So for the nurse practitioner advisory committee, they did meet um, twice uh, just in the last couple months to um, get some regulatory input on sections 101, the transition of practice, 103 NP, and the 104 NP. Um, they passed motions for the regulatory team with BRN and DCA to begin work on drafting language. And in fact, the subcommittees that were formed to provide that information and going on that have met, each one of those subcommittees have met with our regulatory team. And our regulatory team is drafting regulatory language as we can speak. Um, so that is great news to be moving forward on that. We do have an interested party um, committee meeting coming up with the nurse practice and advisory committee that will be scheduled here in um, October as well so that we can get some more input and then um, we will hopefully be presenting some sort of language to the board um, either the November board meeting or we may hold a special board meeting um, we're trying to get some regulatory language in in front of a board prior to the beginning of the year. Is that the entire update? That is the entire update for the nurse practitioner advisory committee. I am here for questions. If you guys have any questions and um, I can provide some answers as best to my ability. Now, do we need to open this up to public comment? Yes, we do. Did you say yes, Lori? Yes, I did. Okay. So um, nobody from the board here has any questions. Is that my understanding? Then we should open it up for public comment, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I would like to remind as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. 
Charlotte Gillup Moore would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Ms. Gillup Moore. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to make a public comment. Um, in regards to the information shared from the um, impact committee uh, section 104 discussion, I would like for the board members here to consider the addition of a grandfather clause for nurse practitioners already working via a nursing corporation as required by the California BRN um, to have the portion of the additional three years time be reduced for those already practicing under their uh, nursing corporation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gulopmore. Committee Chair Woods, there are no other requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, I would. Thank you. Betty, this is Lori. I'll provide additional information on that. Um, currently, that ask is not written into um, the statute that came out through AB 890. Um, and that possibly would have to be included if they wanted to have that in the cleanup bill that is out there as part of the two-year legislation that's um, being put around. But um, as we know with these bills that are passed into statute, the board does not have ability to add or change legislation. We can only write regulation to ad um, address what is already in the law. But the committee itself can uh, see that that could happen? The committee itself cannot write legislation as well. And so because that was not included in the bill, we would not be able to create a regulation that would allow for that. Um, by creating a regulation to allow for that, we would be in fact creating legislation because that would be a new part of the law. Um, and that is something that our board cannot do. So if that is something that needs to be added, um, the stakeholders can reach out to the bill writer that has a cleanup bill going through right now and maybe that would be the avenue that they can pursue that in. So that committee can only change things by going through a completely separate process. It's not up to the BRN to suggest or change or do anything. Is that my understanding? No, Betty. So let me let me try to explain that better. I think I'm I'm not doing a good job at that. So with the passing of AB 890, that has become law that is now in statute. In that language that is law now, it does not have direction for the board to create a grandfathering clause. That if, if the board were to create language, whether through the subcommittee, this committee, the advisory committee or our board, we would be in fact writing legislation. And that is something that we are not tasked to do through the implementing implementation of AB 890. We will be writing regulations that will provide clarification of how to implement what was put into statute with the passing of 890. If there are things in AB 890 that our stakeholders feel that were not addressed within that statute, there is a cleanup bill right now in the in a two year legislative cycle and they can approach the bill writer to see if they would like that to be included. Um, that is a process separate from the BRN, its advisory committees, its board committees or any subcommittees there in. I'm assuming they have that information because when, when I listened into their meeting, it seemed to be yeah, it's it's I believe it's AB 852. Um, I could I could be I could check that to be very clear. Uh, that's that's the cleanup bill. Um, I could get that out there and put that out here in just a moment. If you want me to, it'll take me a second. Reza might have it on the top of his tongue, um, but it is out there. It is public information and there is a cleanup bill that is being put through to address any of the misses um, that the stakeholders feel were not included in the passing of AB 890. I don't remember them discussing that when I listened to your meeting. Thank you. This is 
This is Reza. I was just going to add, I, I don't have off the top of my head the reference to the bill Lori was mentioning, but um, if, it, if it would help at all as far as further clarifying this, the idea of grandfathering for, you know, past experience to reduce the, the number of years required, um, the, the, the commenter was talking about the time period required under 2837.104 for kind of the full independent practice in any setting. Um, but the concept of grandfathering really, as far as the statutes that exist, uh, and I'll, I'll back up, Lori's correct. I think what she uh, was saying was that we can interpret or clarify the existing statutes by regulation, but we can't go beyond that and create brand new requirements that are not you know, clarifications or interpretive of the existing statutes. Um, the idea of grandfathering as currently is in statute relates to the time period under 103 to uh, become a 103 nurse practitioner. Uh, and it, it relates to the three years transition to practice period to get into 103. Uh, as you know, there's, after you do that, there's an additional three year period under 104 to qualify to be a 104 NP. Um, the, the, the bill says at 2837.101, subsection C, that the board can uh, allow uh, for essentially, uh, this is not in the bill, the term, but grandfathering for experience obtained before the passage of the bill. That relates to the transition of practice under 2837.103. Um, the other three-year period under 2837-104 doesn't really have a grandfathering clause in the statute. The only thing it says in the statute is that the board can reduce that time period for uh, those who hold a DNP degree, and discussions have been taking place within the impact about whether to, um, you know, that policy question. Um, but, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that helps add a piece about where there is authority as it relates to, quote, grandfathering um, and where there isn't. And then for the public, the cleanup bill is AB 852, Nurse Practitioners Scope of Practice, Practice Without Standardized Procedures, and it was introduced by Assemblymember Wood in February 17th, 2021. This is currently a two-year bill, and we have talked about this in our legislative um, updates, but that is so the public, if they have um, additional legislative asks um, that are not inclusive of the passing of AB 890, that would be the avenue that would be readily available for them to pursue. Thank you. Do we need to open this to public discussion? Yes. No, we've already opened it up to public comment. There was no vote as this was informational only, and we can move on to item 7.6 if the board um, committee does not have any further questions or discussion. We, we, I think that entire discussion stemmed from a public comment. Uh, it, moderator, were there any other public comments? I presume that was the only one. Correct. That was the only one. Thank you. Okay. Then we can move on to 7.6, Nurse Midwifery Advisory Committee. Lori, will you be doing this information only section? I will. I'll do this information only session as well. The Nurse Midwife Advisory Committee has met one time. Um, they did um, give the chair the authority to create subcommittees. Those subcommittees under the authority of the chair would then um, work to analyze the new sections that um, were put into place under the passing of SB 1237 and then provide input back to the advisory committee in the November advisory committee. And that input would be discussed on whether or not they believe that any regulatory language would need to be written. Um, they may choose to um, uh, work through that process and see that there may be some FAQs that need to go on our website. Um, the differences between AB 890 and SB 1237 is AB 890 had specific direction for the board to 
right regulation. SB 1237 does not have any specific language where it states that the board must write regulation. And therefore, this committee may have a chance to um, do uh, to to look at what has been written and they may not need to. We may not need to promulgate any regulation. Sorry for kind of fumbling through that a little bit. Additionally, the same as with AB 890, SB 1237 asks the committee to consider discipline of the um, nurse midwife. And um, the nurse midwife advisory committee did vote to accept the um, disciplinary guidelines that the BRN currently uses and um, will uh, continue to work towards that. We do plan to bring that same agenda item forward to a nurse midwife advisory committee, and I'll give you guys an update when that is done. So, Lori, I have a question about about this. If are they, is there somebody from that committee that it, are going to be looking over the same cases that we have if it involves um, a nurse midwife? Potentially, they're still working that process out. Um, it would be the abnormal cases um, that they're discussing on whether or not those would go forward. We did give them a bunch of information on like how many cases are typically brought forth that are specific to nurse midwives um, and whether they're um, anything that falls outside of the um, disciplinary guidelines. As we're all very familiar with our disciplinary guidelines, they've been addressing the practice issues of NPs, CNMs, CRNAs, CNSs going for um, in years past. So there has not um, currently been a change to that process. And currently the CNM committee has voted to continue with the same process that we've had um, and we'll continue to flush out the details of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other issues about this um, item 7.6? And do I need to move it to public or not? Because it's information. Public if there are no comments or discussion within the board um, committee members, then we can move to public comment. Doesn't appear that anybody has any uh, questions or issues on it right now. So why don't we move to public no, comment? No questions. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Wood, there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you. All right, I think that takes us to the end of the uh, practice committee. And I'd like to thank everybody for all their input and all the information that we've gotten today. Thank you very much. And we can move it to the next committee.